many of you, when you came to church today, didn't think you were going to get blessed with the uh, with the beautiful singing of uh, our own Julius here. You can thank uh, Tim for being out of town for that. <laughs> Tim might might be uh, might have lost his job. We're not sure. <laughs> Uh, before uh, I get into the word today, let's bow our heads in prayer. Amen. Heavenly Father, I pray uh, that you know you are just pleased today with the worship that we've been providing you. You are a great and holy God, a God that has dominion and sovereignty over everything. God, I pray that if there's anything that uh, I did not write down that you would lit, that you would ask me to share with this group, that it just comes from you into my heart and out of my mouth. If there's anything that I shouldn't say, I pray that it just remains in my sermon and is never heard. <laughs> God, thank you so, so much for Jesus and the sacrifice that he has given us. Thank you so, so much. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Now, uh, we're gonna kick it off. We're gonna jump right into a scripture here. And so, um, if you could turn to 1 John chapter four. I, I want to personally welcome out all the visitors we have today. Uh, We've just been so blessed to have beautiful weather here right by Carson Beach. And if you are visiting, you might notice that uh, the members of the church, they're taking notes. They have their Bibles out. That's because we're a church that believes you need to have your own convictions about the word. You can't just be preached to and then leave. That's not a relationship with God. A relationship with God is one where you are actively participating. So I do encourage you to take notes, to read your through the scriptures as I give them to you. And if you'd like the notes afterwards, I'd be happy to send them to you. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, it says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Amen. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Amen. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. All right, thank you, have a great day. Um, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. No, no, I'm just kidding here. You know, today we will be finishing up our third and final sermon of a three-part series on the book of 1 John. If you missed the first two parts of this series, they are online. Facebook request me, um, you can, that's me right there, you can look me up and I'd be happy to send you the video. The title of my charge today is Know That You Are Loved. Um. John, in the book of 1 John, teaches us that biblical love is a sign of being born of God and knowing God. He states emphatically that believers are to show their love for God by loving one another. Love not only demonstrates God's presence in our lives, it serves as evidence to the rest of the world. Love is how the world is meant to see God, even though they cannot do so physically. Proverbs 8.17 says, I love those who love me, and those who seek me find me. Here, we're showing a correlation between love and seeking after God. Therefore, by extension, love is in and by God. It is his creation just as much as we are his creation. Love in its very essence is a mystical and magical way that we can experience God in our lives. Going back to 1 John chapter 4, it shows us that if we want to get close to God, then we have to love one another. Love is an essential part of being connected to God. You know, I was really convicted this week when I read the following scripture. You can turn to 1 Peter or, you know, listen along. It's towards the end of 1 Peter in chapter 3 verse 7 where it says, 
when talking about how a husband should treat his wife. And I'll be reading out of the amplified version, just so you know. It says, show her honor and respect as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered or ineffective. Now, isn't that a way that you show love to somebody is that you show them respect. But what really convicted me was that second part. It says, your prayers will be hindered. Your prayers will be effective, ineffective if you're not loving. I mean, wow, that's a powerful message. Reading this, it made me think about marriage and how the church is the bride of Jesus. As a recently married man myself, I can tell you, and I'm sure some of you in the audience today can relate to this, holy matrimony is one of the most incredible and yet humbling experiences of your life. You get to know not only your partner, their strengths and their weaknesses, but more importantly, you learn about your own strengths and weaknesses. And if I'm going to be completely honest, I've mostly been learning about my weaknesses. <laughs> One piece of marriage advice I recently received was go to the cross with your marriage, which at first was a little confusing to me. I mean, I know I'm supposed to die to my old self as a disciple. However, there was no married Calder before meeting my beautiful bride. And so while this may be part of the answer, I think another way to look at it is through the perspective of John 3.16. In the Gospel of John, it says in verse 16, chapter 3, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We know that God loves us because he sacrificed his son for us. If you're a baptized disciple, then you can with confidence know that you are loved. Today, our core scripture will be 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 through 21. And the main theme of the sermon will be that God both loves us and that God is love leading believers to love one another. There's a quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson that says, the only way to have a friend is to be one. When I was young and I was growing up, I went on a school trip and we went down to the Cape and it, similar to this, there was a beach and one of the most fun activities that we did was we all got these rubber boots and we were walking through the mud and looking for seashells. And I know my wife is listening right now and she's not fired up about that at all. Um, but for a you know, 10 year old, it was just so exciting. As we were going along and the mud got deeper, my boots started to stick in the mud and I felt my, my boots staying and the rest of my body moving. And everybody started to get ahead of me. And I started to get a little nervous. Then my friend, who was maybe about 20 feet in front of me, I was so worried about, you know, stepping out of my boots and getting my socks muddy. They jumped out of their boots and ran back to me and helped me get through the mud. My first point is faith in him, his spirit. When someone cares about us, it is an almost tangible feeling, is it not? Another way of looking at this is to think about how a room feels when you are sharing space with someone whom you just had an argument with, amen? Mm -hmm. Or if you're around somebody with a negative spirit. Have you ever been there? I see some people nodding their heads. Come on. It's uncomfortable mm -hmm. and it rubs off on us. Sometimes we're the ones that have the bad spirit and that bad spirit then rubs off onto other people. It's the opposite of the feeling you have when someone full of good spirit walks into the room. Both attitudes, the good and the bad are contagious. When love lacks, 
grumbling grows. In Colossians 3, verse 14, it says, And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Our sector, our group here, is bound together by God. You are here today because God brought you here. But are we unified? Does each person here feel loved? Does God feel loved by extension? Do we know how each and every one of our brothers and sisters are doing emotionally and spiritually? Are we wrapping our arms around each other? Do we love others as they wish to be loved or are we loving others the way that we want to be loved? Are we a reflection of God's spirit to those we love or do we have a negative spirit that rubs off causing malcontent and mistrust. Sometimes we can be unloving towards ourselves and this can in turn carry over into our interactions with others. It can affect our ministry. When we study the Bible with someone, it is a pouring out of the heart. But what if there's a little bit of darkness in there? What if we're struggling with something and we try to hide it? Remember, everything that's in the darkness will be brought to the light. Mm -hmm. It can be hard to hold that negativity back. And we may think that people look at us and that we're giving off uh, an aura or just an attitude of positivity, but there's probably something that's off and they notice that. Mm -hmm. This is something that I personally struggle with. Sometimes when I'm feeling down, people will come up to me and I think I'm positive. I'm not, you know, walking around crying, yelling at people, but they can tell that my spirit is slightly off. When it comes to love, we can talk the talk, but it doesn't mean anything if we aren't walking the walk. Come on, Calder. When you get pulled over and you've been drinking, you can tell the officer that you're fine, that you're sober, that you're, everything's okay. But when he pulls you out of the car and he has you walk that line, yeah. you're yeah. guilty. Right. First John chapter four, picking up in our core scripture in verse 13 says, this is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. And we know that he's talking to the disciples here. So this isn't um, direction to non-Christians. It's not saying that if you just love God, that you're saved. So I want you to, to really understand that concept here. This, he's actually speaking to the saved disciples. Those that have accepted that Jesus died for their sins, has accepted them into their heart, has had their heart pricked, and then has been saved. Jumping to 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1, we are taught, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. Here, love is mentioned in the same sentence as faith. When I think of faith, and I think of Jesus, and I think of disciples, three relatable components to our fellowship here, my thoughts are instantly drawn towards Matthew 17. Picking up in verse 20, it says, you know, uh, well, first, before I read the scripture, to give a little bit of background leading up to this verse, Jesus had just rebuked a demon from a boy's body. And then he proceeded to rebuke the sin, which was lack of faith, from the bodies of his disciples as a reason for why they could not themselves 
drive out the evil spirit. Now, picking up in verse 20, Jesus says, Because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. But what does it mean to have faith like a grain of mustard seed? The mustard seed, for those of you that don't know, is one of the tiniest seeds found in the Middle East. However, a fast-growing annual herb, the mustard seed, grows up to 10 feet tall in just a few short months, demonstrating the striking example of the potential of a small, insignificant seed. In the Cambridge Dictionary, it defines the saying, faith can move mountains, as if someone's beliefs and confidence are strong enough, they can achieve something that is very difficult. But I think this simple explanation limits our God. I challenge you that with enough, enough faith, not only can something very difficult be obtained, but truly miracles can occur. Mm -hmm going to Genesis, and I'm going to give you guys a couple of, uh, just, you know, fire these at you really quickly. Our God said, let there be light, and there was light. Our God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water, and it was so. Our God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seeds in it, according to their various kinds, and it was so. Our God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and it was so. Our God said, let the water team with living creatures, let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky, and God saw that it was good. Our God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, and it was so. Our God can do all these things, and yet we limit him here to mere symbolism. I take him at his word that with enough faith, a literal mountain, I don't mean figuratively, I mean that if you have enough faith that a mountain can be moved, that that tree over there can be moved from that side to this side. Right. Is it any less of a miracle that we are standing here today? Right, come on, Father. In Hebrews 11:6 it says, "And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek after him." I want to tell you a story. The story is about an atheist. An atheist is somebody that doesn't believe in God. Now this atheist before becoming an atheist was a Catholic. They're really struggling with their faith. And one day they were sitting in church and they didn't believe in God at all. And they were looking at Jesus up on the cross and they said, one of two things is true. Either Jesus existed and he died for our sins or he did not. And at that moment, this atheist, he prayed to God for faith. So I encourage you today, if you are struggling with your faith, if you are questioning your calling by God, Pray to him. Ask him to give you guidance. Come on. You know, this atheist that I speak of <laughs> is actually our associate evangelist, Aaron Vishikini. <laughs> At the time, he was single. He was trapped by sin. And now he is leading churches. He is saving souls. He's married to an incredible woman. And he has two beautiful children. Come on. This is a miracle greater than a mountain moving from one place to another, if I'm to be honest. Come on. Faith is powerful. Come on. Come on. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see, Hebrews 11.1. 1. Which leads me to my second point. Hope, not fear. Come on. Faith is or equals... You know, another way of saying is, is to say equals it, for all you math whizzes out there. I'm talking to Greg back there. He probably knows math better than I do. <laughs> Faith is confidence in what we hope for. 
which means we have to possess hope, which leads to faith, which can then result in miracles. In Mark 12, a valuable lesson is taught by Jesus. Picking up in verse 28, it says, One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one answer, Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So love is the greatest command there is. In 1 John 4.18, going back to our core scripture here today, it says, there is no fear in love, mm -hmm. but perfect love drives out fear mm -hmm. because fear has, has to do with punishment. Mm -hmm. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. And the church says, Amen. when we are fearful, this can lead us to a paralysis of analysis. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been there? Yeah. Any overthinkers in the audience today? Raise your hand. <laughs> I know I can sometimes turn a small detail into an overwhelmingly huge catastrophe. I could get so wrapped up in my thoughts, insecurities, and fears that before I know it, I'm a mess of emotions. It's during these times that I have to turn to God to find my way out of the muck. In Romans 15, 13, it says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. When I was growing up, there was this clothing brand. It was called No Fear. I actually looked it up online and, and I think they're still selling the t-shirts, but the company did go bankrupt. These t-shirts were very popular from the mid 1990s through the early 2000s. So again, if you're a math whiz, probably only Greg back there, you can pretty quickly figure out how old I am. These shirts challenge you to not let fear control you, to face challenges head on and to proclaim this statement in large silk screen print on oversized skater clothes emblazoned across your torso. <laughs> to be open, one of the ways that I can be fearful at times is when I share my faith. Last year we were doing this campaign where we were trying to share with a certain number of people every day and uh, I, we had a specific number and uh, the number's not important, but what's important is, is the story the, the experience that I had, I was really praying to God to have more fear of him than to fear man. And I really worried about what people thought about me. Now, here I was a disciple because somebody was not fearful. They came up and they shared their faith with me. So it was late at night and I was with the brothers, with the guys, and I knew I had to get to this number of shares and we were leaving the mall and there was these four or five businessmen in suits looking, you know, very similar to the wow I look today. Mm -hmm. And one of my friends challenged me to go share my faith with them. Now, I'll admit, I was so scared. <laughs> I never saw, I've never seen these guys. I figured I'd never probably see them again. <laughs> but then I thought to myself, am I fearing God or am I fearing man in this moment? Come on, caller. And amen, I went up to those guys and I shared my faith with them and they were not open at all. <laughs> but that's okay because God was proud of me for sharing my faith. Right. You know, if you turn almost directly to the middle of the Bible, you come across a scripture that teaches us this concept. In Psalm 118, verse 8, and I'm going to read uh, in the ESV version, it says... It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. Right. When we grasp 
hold of this idea, it helps us to realize that when you share your faith and someone is not open, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting God. Right. Do not feed into the lies of the enemy that he tries to plant in your head. As disciples, we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. God has handpicked you, each and every person listening right now, to love the lost. Come on. Which leads me to my third and final point. Come on, Carla. Love others, hate lies. Come on. Picking back up in 1 John chapter 4, in verse 20, it says, Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister, whom they have seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. So I want, this is a check to see if everybody's awake right now. <laughs> I want you to turn to the person next to you and tell them that you love them. I love you. Go I'm ahead. <laughs> Go turn to your right. Turn to your left. <laughs> Feels pretty good, right? <laughs> now, when I, <laughs> before I became a disciple, and some of you know my conversion story, I was at Stop and Shop, and uh, this guy, Frank Hines, came and shared his faith with me. And that was God moving in Frank, inspiring Frank, because God saw something in me. And Frank was brave and bold, and he shared his faith with me. But it didn't stop there. I didn't just magically become a disciple overnight. He invited me to come out to Bible Talk. And I'm going to be completely open and honest with you. I did not want to go to Bible talk. <laughs> and I wasn't, you know, they were talking about, well, we're going to talk about spiritual things. And I was not a spiritual person. He said, we're going to talk about finances. And my finances were a mess. And, and so I, I reached out to one of my close friends, West, and I asked him if he would go to the Bible talk with me because I knew that he read his Bible and he would always share scriptures with me. And last minute, right before the Bible talk, West... He couldn't make it. So I was ready to not go. I was not going to go by myself. <laughs> then it inspired me. You know, I, I was thinking to myself, who do I know that loves God, reads scripture? And I thought of my friend Alvin. And I don't think it's a coincidence today that I'm preaching this sermon and Alvin's f sitting right here in the first on, row. <laughs> and, you know, Alvin and I, we went to Bible talk and we struggled with the word and we studied the Bible together and we both got baptized together. Come on, come on. You know, in Romans, yeah, let me clap about that. I wouldn't have done that if it wasn't because of the love of a friend. God loved me, Jesus loved me, Frank loved me by sharing with me, but it was a friend that was there with me that helped me wrestle with the word, that helped me when I was struggling with you know what it meant to be a disciple. When I counted the cost and I said, Jesus is Lord, I took that command seriously. And the only way I could get to that point was because I had a friend there with me going through the same thing. Come on. In Romans 12, 10, it says, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Mm. Come on. As a married man, this is something I have to live out daily. If I'm ever selfishly only looking out for myself and not caring about my wife, then I am not living out the love that God expects out of me. And I am not leading my marriage. If you skip down to verse 16, it says, live in harmony with one another. Mm. Yesterday, Whistley and I, we went to the AMS jam session, two o'clock every Saturday. That's my advertisement for it. I encourage you <laughs> to go there. And it was so cool to see these talented musicians and singers singing as Whistley and I watched eating our burritos. <laughs> it's amazing. You can take a group of 10 people and they're all talented musicians but if they're all playing their own song what is it does it sound good no, no it sounds horrible <laughs> to be in harmony with others means to accept that you might have to play life 
you might have to interact with somebody on their terms and not on yours. So what is the soundtrack of your life? Mine. Are you harmonizing with those around you? Or are you walking to your own beat in discord with your brothers and sisters, family and friends? Come on, Carter. Are you making every effort? I'm not saying some effort. I'm not saying are you being civil with your spouse or your friend or your roommate. I'm saying are you making every effort to listen or are you just waiting for your turn to talk? Mm. Are you tuning others out while you turn up the volume of your pride and self-focus? Mm. If this at all sounds like you, I want you to remember that the opposite of being prideful is being humble. Right. Pride does not co cohabitate with love. Right. Come on. You can repent from whatever sin you're in today. It does not have to be a decision that takes a week or takes a month. You can turn and run away from these things that are holding you back. Yeah. You are either facilitating the funk or glowing <laughs> in God's grace. Come on, come on. In Ephesians 4, chapter, uh, I'm sorry, in Ephesians 4, verse 2 through 3, it says, that we are instructed rather to be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in what? In love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 through 5, it says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, right. having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Come on. This is a warning mm -hmm. about quietly being critical or disagreeing with those that you say that you love. Right. Crucify this aspect of your character. It's going to eat you up from the inside out. Yeah. This way of thinking is a lie that Satan has fed you. Yeah. But like rotten fruit that has spoiled, it will not give you any nutrients. Right. Come As on. we come up to the end of my sermon, let's reflect on our three points. Point number one, faith in him, his spirit. Faith leads to miracles. Present a welcoming spirit in everything that you do. Make a list of impossible prayers. Persistently bring your requests before God. Point number two, hope, no fear. Love and fear cannot coincide. Have a hope for a future and believe that God will find a way. Be bold and brave when sharing your faith. Come on. And point number three, love others, hate lies. Repent of your pride. I plead with you, forgive others and live in his grace. Have daily communication with spiritual people. If you take the first word from each of my points, you get faith, hope, and love. These mm -hmm. things live together. In 1 Corinthians 13, 13, it says, and now these three remain, faith, hope. hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Come Which on. brings us back to the first slide of my sermon. Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. The amount of love we carry around in us and we pour out onto others correlates to how much of God we have in our lives. Mm -hmm. You cannot read your Bible 
every day and have a hard heart. Mm -hmm. You can't pray and then not forgive. Right. You can't sing songs of worship and have a negative spirit. Mm -hmm. You can't acknowledge that Jesus died for your sins and desire anything but to repent, get baptized, and then share the miracle of your salvation with the lost. Come on. As I wrap up this sermon, the final in our three-part series on the book of 1 John, where we've talked so much about life, light, love, growth, grace, hope, and faith. I want to leave you with some lyrics from the song, Our God is Love. It says, every soul, every beating heart, every nation and every tongue, come find hope in the love of the Father. All creation will bow as one, lift their eyes to the risen sun. Jesus Savior forever and after. This is love. Jesus came and died and gave his life for us. Let our voices rise and sing for all he's done. Our fear is overcome. Our God is love. Our God is love. Every distant and broken heart, every prayer, every outstretched arm, finding hope in the love of the Father. Age to age, let his praises rise. All the glory for all time. Jesus Savior forever and ever. At age to age, we will sing in the light of all he's done, all the earth, every one, singing in the wonder of his love. I want to thank you for partaking in this adventure with me through the book of 1 John. I pray that by emulating the love of God, each and every one of you can be transformed. I love all of you so much, and I'm honored and humbled to have been able to share the message of one of my favorite books of the Bible with you over the past three weeks. We have many exciting adventures to come though. And I'm humbled to think that we will be on this journey together because he chose us. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen.